field work. The National Agricultural Statistics Service says there was only 3.2 days good for field work. The rain, however, was sporadic between an inch to six inches across the state. And field agronomist Mark Johnson reported nearly nine inches over four days in Ankeny in central Iowa. Here are some of the fields near there. They seem to be handling the rain well, though driving through you would see signs of ponding. 27% of the state has surplus topsoil moisture. Soybean planting is now well behind last year at 93%, but equal to the five-year average, with southwest and south-central Iowa struggling to get the last quarter of their crop in the ground. Soybean emergence is at 83%. The corn in central Iowa looks like it has a good stand. Statewide, it's reached 98% emergence, six days behind last year, but four days ahead of the average, and 84% of corn is rated good to excellent. Nationally, the corn and soybean crops are in marginally worse condition than they were a year ago, with some acres still not planted. Analyst Jamie Kowaki with Paragon Investments says the markets are still mulling that all over. Uh, there's still a big debate uh, going on yet right now, which I think will probably last another week to 10 days at least. Uh, you know, is there 4 million acres, 5 million acres yet to plant in southern Iowa, uh, northern Missouri especially? And uh, how does that all play out? Does it go, you know, majority to beans or does it prevent plant? And uh, pretty much the market is still trying to decipher that. Less acres and corn, more acres and beans maybe. Is the wetness in beans or, you know, cold feed not good for beans? Is it already affecting the yields? And uh, how does that all affect in the market right now? It's kind of a big tug of war with the rest of the Corn Belt looking very, very good. Yeah, we had a kind of a big wash out there late last week. Uh, cash market has been pulling back pretty aggressively on very light trade, though. I think cattle here are still a bit weaker uh, here short term, the, uh, the live cattle especially. And uh, I think we continue to narrow that basis down. It's gotten pretty ugly here, you know, last week in the hogs. I think the August of 75 is, is, is way overdone. I still think you could, you know, get up in the, you know, put an eight in front of it yet very, very easily before expiration. But we've seen the cash market drop off, you know, cutouts drop off, and just seen heavy, heavy liquidation. I buy the longs. The U.S. Country of Origin Labeling Rule, or COOL, has been around for a while and requires meat labels to describe where animals have been born, raised, and slaughtered. But after the World Trade Organization last month found it unfairly discriminated against imported livestock, Congress has been scrambling to repeal the rule to avoid costly ret trade retaliation. Unless the Senate takes cues from the House and also repeals COOL, National Pork Producers Council President-elect John Weber says Canada and Mexico won't hesitate to tighten the thumbscrews on the U.S. livestock sector. I think both countries are ready to uh, put significant tariffs on a wide variety of products. Um, we're somewhat fearful with the amount of pork we export to Mexico that significant tariffs could be placed on pork products, uh, obviously making them more competitive and, and in the international market. And uh, uh, Canada is going to do the same the same thing. Uh, we don't expect to be left off of the retaliation list. Without repeal, the retaliation is expected to total three and a half billion dollars between Canada and Mexico, which in 2014 imported 900 million and one and a half billion dollars in U.S. pork, respectively. We put stories up every day. Check out whotv.com. Click news, then agribusiness.